you. Senator Wu. Thank you, Your Honour. Let me first of all thank Senator uh, Ringet, Senator Plett, Senator Delfon for their interventions. It's a reminder of how important third reading debate is because tonight we've heard some, I think, some new information that should help all of us come to a decision, not just on this amendment, but on the bill as a whole. Senator Delfon, in his closing remarks, admonished us to legislate based on facts. And while all of you and all of us will have to decide what we think are, in fact, the facts, I think you will agree that we've heard information from Senator Delfon and Ringette in particular that, um, that don't correspond to the avalanche of information that we've been bombarded with from, from the lobby groups. Again, it's up to all of you, all of us, to decide which facts we choose. But I'm so grateful to my colleagues for providing us with some alternative viewpoints. I'm also very grateful for the opportunity to join debate on this amendment because I was not present in the chamber when the report was debated and voted on. I was, of course, part of the ACFO committee that um, developed the report, and I voted uh, in favour of this amendment at committee, i.e. the amendment to remove barns from the C-234 exemptions. I was disappointed to not have had the opportunity to speak to that amendment before the chamber as a whole uh, voted on the report, so I am taking this opportunity tonight. Uh, to those of you who are questioning why we are revisiting an amendment that was rejected along with the committee report, I hope my intervention will offer a fresh perspective and perhaps even change a few minds. Senator Delfon's amendment challenges us to reflect on the difference between barns and grain dryers in terms of their ability to respond to a price signal to reduce emissions in energy use. It is based on the supposition that there are more lower emission options for the heating of buildings than there are for grain dryers. This is a correct supposition. Senator Delfon has already elaborated on it. And it is a powerful argument for removing barns from the C-234 exemption. The heating and cooling of barns, of buildings, including barns, can be improved with lower emissions through better insulation, construction, ventilation technologies that are all readily available today. Emissions can also be reduced by switching in whole or in part to renewable energy sources where available and by installing heat pumps. Yes, heat pumps. I am aware that this humble and rather unattractive appliance based on a technology that is decades and decades old, has recently become an icon of culture wars propagated by those who are skeptical about the science of climate change, hooked on fossil fuel in their daily use, or just resistant to change. They have vilified heat pumps as a kind of status imposition that violates their freedom to pollute and or that does not even address the heating and cooling needs. It reminds me a bit of um, you know, hybrid vehicles when they first appeared 20 years ago. And th there was kind of a feeling that if you drive a hybrid vehicle, you're kind of trying to make a statement or you're trying to be cool and maybe not really sincere. That's, of course, all changed very much since then. Heat pumps seem to have that kind of image now. In fact, there are similar culture wars going on in Europe over heat pumps. In Germany, for example, where the government tried to insist on heat pumps as the preferred source of energy for new construction, there was a, an uproar led by the IFD, the alternative for Deutschland, you know, the far right, I won't use the word, but the far right party that used this support for heat pumps as a kind of socialist intervention. Similar debates are taking place in the United States, the UK, and Poland, again led typically by right-wing parties in those countries. 
Let me uh, quote from the MIT Technology Review on the efficacy of heat pumps in cold climates. This is a document uh, from the MIT Technology Review, and it says, I quote, that the claim heat pumps don't work well in really cold weather is often repeated by fossil fuel companies because they have a competing product to sell. Now, there's a kernel of truth here. Heat pumps can be less efficient in extreme cold. As the temperature difference between inside and outside increases, a heat pump will have to work harder to gather heat from that outside air. But there are heat pumps operating everywhere, from Alaska to Maine and the United States. And in Norway, 60%, Norway, a cold country, by the way, 60% of buildings are heated with heat pumps. Colleagues, even if heat pumps are not as efficient in extremely cold temperatures, the economic and the climate-friendly solution is to have a secondary energy source to supplement the heat source. Let me now quote from a 2022 study by Ferguson and Sager, which has found that cold climate air source heat pumps generate less GHG emissions than oil furnaces in all parts of Canada, not just in my corner of the country. These same heat pumps generate less GHG emissions than gas furnaces in BC, in Manitoba, in Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. The operating costs of cold climate air source heat pumps are less than electric resistance or oil furnaces for space, space heating in all parts of Canada. And in regions where natural gas prices are low, the operating costs of cold climate air source heat pumps are more comparable to the operating costs of a conventional gas furnace. In other words, the case for heat pumps, even in extremely cold temperatures, is very strong. Now, Senator Delphon is correct to remind us that barns are different from grain dryers insofar as there are alternative technologies for the heating and cooling of these structures, which produce lower emissions. If we believe in the importance of the greenhouse gas pollution pricing regime and the vital role that carbon pricing plays in incentivizing change, that should be a sufficient reason for us to support his amendment. But colleagues, it would not be correct to say or to extrapolate that this, this argument, to extrapolate from this argument to say that green dryers are off the hook. You see, the important point here in terms of the broader policy logic of GHG pollution pricing is not that barns have an energy alternative and grain dryers don't, and therefore grain dryers should be spared. That fallacy is based on the idea that a carbon price only works when there are technology alternatives available. Let me say that again. This is a fallacy that presumes that a carbon price only works when there are alternative technologies available. Indeed, this is a core argument among advocates of C234 who say that the lack of alternatives to the use of natural gas for grain drying renders a fuel charge useless on that energy source. Indeed, much of the debate on C234 has focused on when can we expect a brand new technology that will allow farmers to stop using natural gas altogether. The lack of a clear answer has been used as an argument to exempt grain drying for at least the next eight years. But this point of view represents a flawed understanding of how a carbon price works, and we see it repeated over and over again, most recently in the letters from Pulses Canada and from one of our colleagues who sent an email to all of us this morning. The effect of a price signal 
is to incentivize farmers to reduce their use of carbon-intensive fuels using all means possible, including investments in energy efficiency based on current technologies. The point of the carbon price is to incentivize farmers to move closer to what's called the technology frontier, whatever the prevailing commercial technology or technologies might entail, the prevailing technology or technologies. The price mechanism, the carbon price, does not rely solely on breakthrough technologies that are totally novel, even though price signals will encourage innovation that could bring about such breakthroughs. Now, some of you will argue that all grain farmers are already at the technology frontier, but that is not a credible argument. Senator Dalfon has already given some reasons why it's not credible. But let me point to one of the bill's star witnesses at AGFO who admitted that he had only recently traded in his 50-year-old grain dryer for a new one, resulting in substantial energy and cost savings. And Senator Pallette has just told us that the Nico grain dryer will produce large cost and energy savings. But this is exactly the point of the price incentive. It is reasonable to expect that other farmers, grain drying farmers, will factor in a carbon price when they're thinking about replacing their 50 or 40 or 30 year old grain dryer and perhaps switching to the NICO model. Now, if you are still in doubt that there are other energy efficiency measures that farmers can avail of short of a totally new energy source, consider that the federal government's agricultural clean technology program is massively overscribed by farmers. Most advocates of the bill are also calling for an increase in funding for this program. We heard it at QP with Minister Gilbo last week. That, to me, is as clear an admission as one can have about the existence of energy efficiency measures for farmers that are available today. Now, some of you will be thinking that farmers already act in their self-interest when it comes to energy efficiency, so a price signal is not necessary. I'm an economist. My own sense is that farmers are not much different from other folks and that price incentives matter. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, that every barn-owning, grain-drying farmer is already maximizing his or her energy savings based on natural gas and propane. Let's also assume that a brand new technology using an alternative energy source appears in eight years, which is what most of the advocates say will happen. At that time, farmers using natural gas will have the choice of switching to a new technology at considerable cost or paying $170 a ton for emissions, up from $65 a ton this year. My prediction is that they will choose neither because the adjustment costs will be too sudden. It will be too large. And we will have made that happen. We will have allowed that to happen. Instead, what they will do is they will lobby Parliament to extend the exemption, which will be easy to do under the current version of this bill since we defeated the amendment proposed by Senator Monsion. What could have been a gradual adjustment to new technology based on $15 a ton yearly increments to the price of emissions, emissions has become a massive burden that kicks in on January the 1st, 2031. You can see how C-234 undermines the logic of pollution pricing and intensifies political pressure to abandon the regime. Colleagues, I, I, I will return to this idea in my third reading speech on the main motion. I wanted to speak uh, narrowly on the amendment. Suffice to say for now that this amendment has great merit. In his closing remarks, Senator Delfon asked that we draw a line against further erosion of carbon pricing in Canada. I, I don't want to over-dramatized, but that is what we're doing here today if we 
vote for the amendment, we will draw a line against further erosion of carbon pricing. I support the amendment. I hope you will too. Thank you.